Hello, today we're going to discuss the conservation of momentum. Much like any other law of conservation, the law of conservation of momentum says that momentum in a system will be conserved. The key here, though, is that this occurs when there is no outside forces acting on the system. We'll talk in a second about the inside forces and what role they play in the conservation of momentum. But as long as there's no forces from the outside affecting the system or acting upon the system, the momentum will be conserved. What does that look like in terms of variables? We know our, relate, our variable for momentum is a lowercase p. So we'll say in our system that the p naught equals pf. And this is for the total momentum in the system, not just for one individual object. Okay, so we're looking at a group of objects interacting together in some way. And so we can express this out and say that the initial momentum of, say, object one, plus the initial momentum of object two will equal the final momentum of object one plus the final momentum of object two, okay? One other thing to keep in mind is that momentum is a vector quantity, okay? We know that momentum is mass times velocity. Mass is a scalar, velocity is a vector. So when you multiply a scalar times a vector, you get a vector. The direction of an object's motion is very important for its momentum, okay? If they're in opposite directions, they must have opposite signs for their momentum. So why is momentum conserved? That's the real question we need to get at. Here's a classic momentum example. You have two people, notice that they are wearing ice skates. Okay, that's very important to notice, they are wearing ice skates. So they're on a nearly frictionless surface, the best one we can you know, come up with in our everyday life. And they're gonna stand in front of each other and they're gonna push apart on one another. We know from Newton's third law that the force that is applied on each of them has to be the same, right? So the male will push on the lady with the same force, the lady pushes back on the guy with the same force, and therefore, you know, Newton's third law says that those forces, the force pair idea, okay? We also know that they are applying the force on one another for the same amount of time, okay? So you have the force times the time. And what have we talked about already that's force times time? That's right, impulse, okay? So they have the same impulse, the same change in momentum is going to be the same. But what's gonna be different? Exactly right, the direction, okay? So if the lady goes backward with some final momentum, the man's also gonna go backward, but his is to the left with the same final momentum. Okay, if we look at the diagrams, we assume that the man probably has a greater mass than the lady does. But they will have the same final momentum, okay? So their velocities will have to be different. So the lady will go back at a faster speed than the man, but they will have the same equal and opposite momentum values. Okay, so keep that in mind. It's the same force being applied to each of them for the same amount of time, which we know will cause the same impulse, okay? We have two different types of collisions that we're gonna look at. The first one are inelastic collisions, where the in means not, elastic means something to do with bouncing. So in an, in an inelastic collision, the objects do not bounce off. They instead, they stick together, okay? They will have the same final velocity because they are sticking together. So if we set up our momentum conservation equation, we would say P naught equals PF. And we'll have to say P1 naught plus P2 naught equals P1F plus P2F. And we know that this is just M11 V1 naught plus M2 V2 naught equals m1 times v f plus m2 times vf. Okay, so the vfs are the same in an perfectly inelastic collision. Okay, so we could factor out the m1 and the m2 and make this instead equal to m1 plus m2 times vf, but that doesn't really matter, whatever you want to do, okay? Momentum, of course, is conserved because the forces in between the two objects that are colliding are applying the same force on one another for the same amount of time. But the key here, though, is this last phrase, okay? In an inelastic collision, momentum, or momentum is conserved, but energy is not, okay? Energy is not. So we will say for this type of collision 
that the initial kinetic energy of our system will be greater than the final kinetic energy because the energy is being lost due to the deformation of the objects involved. Their shape will change when they collide and stick together. So there has to be some loss of energy. Okay, and usually that occurs due to light, sound, heat, all those kind of things as well in the ways that energy can be lost. All right, so that's a not elastic collision. So of course that's gonna lead us to elastic collisions. When you have an elastic collision, a perfectly elastic collision, objects will bounce off of one another and more likely have different final velocities. Case okay, so the rare occasion they could have the same final velocity, so that is very few and far between. Momentum, of course, is always conserved. In this case, energy is also conserved. Okay. The reason for this is that when we have a perfectly elastic collision, we're assuming that the objects that are interacting are not compressible. Okay. And this is a big assumption that is made that is not applicable to the real world. All right. One of the same things with the ideal gas law in chemistry. If you have two objects that interact with each other, our most common example would be like billiard balls. If they interact with one another, even on the molecular level, the subatomic level, there's going to be some compression. Our naked eyes can't see that compression, but there will be compression. Okay, so there's no such thing as a perfectly elastic collision, much like there's no such thing as a massless rope or a frictionless surface. But for our purposes, we're going to make that assumption that there will be a perfectly elastic collision. In this case, you could say that both momentum and energy in our system will be conserved. Okay? And so there is an occasion where you could use these two, these two relationships and solve a system of equations to determine what the final speed would be for the objects. However, that is very rarely asked and I wouldn't expect you have to do it. It's a lot of a lot of algebra involved with that. All right, so let's work one quick example. We'll do an inelastic collision, and we'll get the heck out of here. So in our example, we have a 1,200 kilogram car traveling 10 meters per second east, collides inelastically with an 800 kilogram car traveling at 8 meters per second west. What's the final speed of the two car system? Okay, so we'll make the 1,200 kilogram car car one. So we'll call that M1. Okay. It's initially traveling at 10 meters per second east. Okay, so that's going to be V1 naught. Our 800 kilogram car is mass 2. Okay, and its initial speed is 8 meters per second west. What do you notice about the velocities? That's right, they're in opposite directions. So when we plug them into our momentum relationship, they must have opposite sides. So let's go ahead and start with this. We know that momentum is conserved, and any time you have a collision, you should always start with conservation of momentum. That's the one thing you always know is going to apply. Conservation of energy it may not necessarily apply, unless the question comes out and says explicitly, this is a perfectly elastic collision, you cannot make that assumption. Okay? So we have two objects involved in our equation here, so I have M1 V1 naught plus M2 V2 naught. And because it's inelastic, I'm going to go ahead and put my M1 and my M2 together, okay? Because I know it's going to be inelastic. So we'll go ahead and plug in our values now, pretty straightforward. I'll make east positive. It's because it's what we normally use to the right, to the east is positive. So we'll make that 10 meters per second positive plus 800 kilograms times negative 8 meters per second. It's in the opposite direction, so it must have an opposite sign. And that will equal 1,200 kilograms plus 800 kilograms times Vf. Okay, so let's evaluate some things here. 1,200 times 10 is 12,000. So we get our initial momentum of car 1 is 12,000 kilograms meters per second. 800 times negative 8 is negative 6,400 kilograms meters per second equals 2,000 kilograms times Vf. Okay, so we'll say, plug in our calculator, 12,000 minus 6,400 is 5,600. We divide by 2,000 and we get the final speed of our two cars together is a positive 2.8 meters per second. Okay. So it makes sense. The speed should be less than the speeds of the two beforehand because now we're combining two masses together. And we should also pay attention to the sign. 
Okay, what is that sign going to tell us? Exactly right, the direction. Okay, so the positive sign lets us know it's in the same direction as the one we set up here that was positive. Okay, which makes sense. Car one has more momentum than car two does. So there's more momentum to the east pre-collision. Therefore, there must be more momentum to the east post-collision. And that's why the sign should be to the right and positive. All right, so that's conservation of momentum. Hopefully you got a little bit out of it today. And uh, we'll see you later. Thanks.